activists have to accept two things when they decide to work for their cause. They're going to be either heroes or anti-heroes, depending on who's looking. I was like any other 15-year-old when I was first introduced to the idea of activism. I was on a train to Oslo with a friend of mine to buy these really nice leather boots. And two friends of my friends sat down with us and started with their sales tricks to try and convince me to join their environmental activism organization. I knew what activism was. I'd seen pictures of people chained to trees shouting at politicians. But I never really thought about what these people were doing or why. I just thought of them as a special brand of crazy, you know? And the people sitting in front of me sort of confirmed my suspicions when they tried to get me to show Norway's national oil company the finger as the train drove past one of their billboards. Now, let's just say that behind their somewhat strange tactic, they had a convincing case. I've spent the last three years in that organization. It's Norway's biggest youth environmental organization, and I worked my way from being a regular member to sitting in the national board over a span of two years. And in those two years, I learned a lot. I learned that environmental activism is difficult because we're not always in popular opinion. It's much more comforting to support the companies who provide gas for your car than the people who want you to switch to an electric. And it's things like these that makes it difficult to be an activist. It's the classic tale of David and Goliath. Our entire budget is about half the size of Norway's national oil company's PR budget alone. So we have to rely on getting our information out in different ways. That means being loud and crazy enough to get the media's attention at every single action and demonstration that we have. The things that work are cheers, songs, and sometimes civil disobedience. It always gets the journalists there, but it doesn't always get your message across in the way they originally intended. And just getting attention won't really get you anywhere. You have to go where all the big companies go and do what they hire professionals to do. You have to go to meetings and lobby. Now, imagine a 40-something-year-old guy in a suit standing outside of a conference room, ready to convince lawmakers to open up a new, oil, to open up a new section for oil extraction. Right behind them tapping their shoulders and ready to distract them, is where we are. We're way less experienced, often a lot younger, and ready to compete with professional lobbyists for attention. But as we all know, sometimes politicians fall through on their promises. So we practice and we prepare for the day when we might have to chain ourselves down in order to protect our own future. Last year, we had a camp in one of Norway's last clean fjords. And there we practiced how to commit civil disobedience the right way. The way that lets you exercise your constitutional rights without getting in trouble. We do these things to ensure that if or when the day comes, when we need to push the law in order to protect our own future, we know we're prepared. And sometimes you lose. But sometimes. Sometimes you win. And recently, we won for the sixth time. There are these places up north in Norway called Lofoten, Vesterholm, and Senja. There you find the world's last big cod tribe, the only cold water reef we know of, and many species of whale, marine mammals, and endangered seabirds call this area home. And underneath that, there's oil. I went there for the, sec for the first time in March 2011. There, not only were the views spectacular, but talking to the people who lived there, who made their living on the ocean right outside their doorstep, and the people we were there to fight for, things like that make an impression. I was there for the second time last summer, during my organization's summer or camp. That year, we hosted an international camp with participants from all over Europe, as well as countries like Nigeria, Canada, and the US. We all gathered in Lufoten with one common goal to demonstrate the extreme opposition against oil drilling in these areas, as well as to take our worldwide stand against the fossil fuel future. And the other reason why we held to that camp in that area is because when you go to the area you're prepared to fight for, you get emotional ties to that place. And I mean, as an activist, you do become emotionally attached to the things that you fight for. I cried when the newly elected government decided to listen to us despite strong voices in the parties that demanded oil extraction in these beautiful, valuable, and vulnerable areas. 
But sometimes, governments can be blind, deaf, and difficult. And then we need to push it a little bit further. In Sweden, in 2012, over 70 activists snuck inside of a nuclear power plant. They cut or climbed their way through the fences and hid. Over three days later, six activists had yet to be found. And these activists were hiding in the room that housed the main control panel for the main electricity grid of the entire plant. I met one of the guys who were hiding in there at a seminar about nuclear power in Norway, and he told me that while they were playing games on their phones and messaging to the outside world, guards rushed past outside looking for the people hiding right under their noses. It's ridiculous that we have to go to these extreme measures, but politicians aren't always keen on doing the things that are going to pay off in 10 or 20 years, because that's not what's going to get you reelected today. And that's why we're important, because we do these things, we push the boundaries. And this is how things have to go sometimes. The life of an activist is the life of an eternal questioner. Of someone who's always asking the whys and the hows and what the possible outcomes and results may be. We might not do as much as you think we do, but we accomplish more than you might think. I mean, <laughs> I mean, activists are members of society who see a problem and they decide to solve it. I met most of my best friends at seminars about activism, and they're the living proof that there are no qualifications or needs that you need to have to be an activist. You only need to care. And you know you've found the right group of friends when they see a problem and decide that they want to solve it and fight for the rights of themselves or others. And yet, we're considered a weird sort of minority as activists for fighting for these big things that already seem lost. But the truth is, activism is a central part of today's society and is becoming more and more important. As companies lobby against making access to clean water a human right, lobby for oil, oil extraction in the vulnerable areas of the Arctic, or simply raise the price on your local public transport, we need activists to rally up and fight against them. My days as an activist began in a trip to buy leather boots. Anyone can be an activist. Thank you.